Good morning and welcome to Power for Today Prophetic Ministries with George Dello. And uh, we're going to be having our guest on again today. California, my good friend, uh, Warren Larkin, will be joining me. And uh, we're going to be looking a little bit about the real the real purpose of God and, uh, uh, and bringing us into a place where we will uh, be a people that glorify him upon this earth. And uh, uh, how how we get to that place and what God does to to bring us into that place, but just to see that uh, God's uh, purpose for for uh, saving us and bringing us into His kingdom. So uh, uh, here we go, uh, Warren. Good to see you this morning. Uh, nope, you you had it right the first time. There you go. That's that's it. That's what you want. Amen. <laughs> and uh, and. and Am I, am I centered in mine? Or? Yeah, yeah, you're good. You could go a little bit, just about two inches to your left. <laughs> that's close enough. Yeah, no, that's good. Amen. Yeah, good Let's morning, start. my friend. God bless. This Amen. is the day that the Lord hath made. Yeah. Yes, it is. It looks like it's going to be a nice one here. So, uh, actually, we, we've been back and forth like a yo-yo in our weather here. One day it's in the 20s, and now it's uh, today it's supposed to be in the 70s. and I think uh, next couple of days in the seventies, then was going back down to the fifties during the day. So it's just uh, just crazy. Not good. Not good for your uh, your sinuses and stuff. <laughs> back and forth. But anyway, uh, let, let's uh, go ahead and have a, a, a word of prayer, and uh, then we're going to get into uh, uh, some things about, about this. So, Father, we just want to thank you for this day you've given us. We thank you for your abundant uh, grace you put upon us. Your mercies are new every morning. We, we thank you for your word and your spirit. Lord, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you come to lead us and guide us into the truth, to uh, open the word to understand it. We pray that you anoint it to work effectively in us, that you direct our thoughts and words uh, for the edification of your people, Lord God, and uh, just instruct us in your way, Father God, that you be glorified in everything that's said and done. We commit this time into your hands. And uh, give you the praise, the glory, and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, praise God. I want to welcome everybody on Facebook Live. All of these videos you can find on my Facebook page as well as my YouTube page at George Dello. Just put me in the uh, search box and these things will pop up. But i uh, got my good friend again, uh, Warren Larkin, with me. And we're going to be looking at uh, some of the scriptures today concerning... Um, our, our real purpose of salvation, uh, as far as you know, why God saves us and, and why He does what He He does, and and why what Jesus came to do, uh, so that we can fulfill uh, God's purpose. And I, I just want to begin by reading uh, several scriptures from the Old Testament, and these are all prophetic scriptures, and they're all uh, prophesies prophecies concerning uh, the new covenant that would come through Jesus Christ and and what God would do through Christ to uh, uh, bring us into that full work whereby we would uh, uh, be his people. And uh, all of these really speak to um, <clears throat> God's ultimate purpose in saving us. Because a lot of times we, we focus on these, these simple things like, well, God loves us and, and things like that. But when we look at the scripture says, there's a, there's a, a lot deeper meaning to to, to God's calling. And when we understand why uh, uh, God calls us to this place, we can understand what Jesus did better. We can understand why uh, we need things like sanctification. We need things like holiness. We need uh, this working of Christ in order to really fulfill God's purpose uh, that he, he created us for. So let's look at a couple of these. And I'm going to uh, begin in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 3, and this is, uh, I'm going to read this, the Amplified Bible, and, and if you've been in the Word for long, you'd probably quote this yourself, but uh, this is very key to uh, uh, our understanding of this. So he tells us in Isaiah 61, 3, to grant consolation and joy. Now, uh, let, let me just throw this, if you're not familiar with this verse, but he, he begins, because this is one he was talking about, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the good news. So down in verse 3, he says, To grant consolate and joy to those who mourn in Zion, to give them an ornament, a garland, or diadem of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, the garment expressive of praise instead of a heavy burden and failing spirit. 
Okay, so in other words, he's saying God, Jesus came to do a work in order to give us all of these things to, to change our very uh, character, our nature, our, our, our countenance, everything about us to change us into this new creation. And then he tells us exactly why he does this. He says that they may be called oaks of righteousness, lofty, strong, and magnificent, distinguished for uprightness, justice, and right standing with God. In other words, God sent Jesus Christ to do a work in us whereby we would become a people that are distinguished for righteousness, for our relationship with God. And he says, the planning of the Lord, and here it is right here, that he may be glorified. In other words, everything about what Jesus came to do was to this end, that God himself would be glorified through his people. So let's look at a couple other ones. Isaiah 60, 21. Your people shall also shall be uncompromisingly and consistently righteous, they shall possess the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I, God, may be glorified. Again, this is God's purpose. This is God's ultimate calling, that God will be glorified through us. In Exodus chapter 28, verse 22, he says, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, O Sidon, and I will show forth my glory and be glorified in the midst of you. And they shall know that I am the Lord, when, my ex when I execute judgments and punishments in her and am set apart and separated and my holiness is manifested in her. So here we can now see the connection between glory and sanctification, okay? Sanctify means to make holy. So when he says that my holiness be manifested in her, that God can be glorified, what he is telling us is God is glorified when his holiness is manifested in his people, in his church, okay? And then the last one I want to touch on is Ezekiel 36. And uh, uh, this is one of the, uh, the, the most key ones in all of this because this really brings this out. And I want to begin in a couple verses in uh, uh, Ezekiel 36, beginning in verse uh, 17. And uh, Israel was backslidden. Israel was in rebellion and sin against God. And so God tells Israel prophetically he's going to do something to change this whole relationship with him. So he says, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own ways and deeds. To me, their way was like the uncleanness of a woman and her customary impurity. So he's saying, because when Israel was in the land and God fulfilled his promise to them, they, they went to rebellion and sin and defiled the land, okay? So in verse, uh, 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 he goes on and says, so he scattered them to the nations. And in uh, verse 20, he says, when they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. So God is speaking here. God says, even when he cast them out of the land, he sent them into captivity, they still, they profaned his name. That word profane means to, to, to uh, dishonor. It, 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 it means to, uh, uh, you, you know, tarnish the name of God, to make him look bad, okay? And so he says, uh, they profaned my name uh, wherever they went. When they said of them, these are the people of the Lord, they, shall, they have gone out of the land. But he, but he says, but I had concern, now watch this, I had concern, not for Israel, not for this, this, this sinful people. He says, I had concern for my holy name, okay, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. So he says in verse 22, therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake. In other words, God saying, I'm I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna deliver you. I'm not gonna save you. I'm not gonna, you know, do, get you out of the situation for your sake. I'm doing it for my sake. He says, I'm not doing this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. So God says, and I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations 
which you have profaned in their midst, and the nation shall know yes. that I am the Lord, says the Lord, Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. Okay, they will know that uh, uh, I am Lord when I am hallowed before you in in you before their eyes. In other words, God is saying His name will be glorified. His name will be vindicated when His people are made holy and live and walk, just as we saw with with uh, uh, Ezekiel twenty eight and Isaiah sixty one and sixty. When we walk and live a life of righteousness before the nations, okay, we glorify his name. So in verse 23, he says, I will vindicate the, the holiness of my great name and separate it for its holy purpose from all that defiles it, including his people, okay, including his people. My name, which has been profaned among the nations, which profaned among them, and the nations will know, understand, and realize that I am the Lord, the sovereign ruler who calls forth loyalty and obedient service when I shall be set apart by you and my holiness vindicated in you before their eyes and yours. What's he saying? The only way that, that, that God is going to be glorified is, and have his name uh, vindicated because of our profaning him because of our sin, he says, is when I can make you holy, I can change you into this new creation whereby you live a life of righteousness that he may be glorified. And how is he going to do this? Well, he tells us right here in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25 to 27, mm -hmm. here's how he's going to do it. Here's how he's going to do it. Here's how he's going to vindicate his name. Here is how he's going to do this work in us so that we can glorify God upon this earth. So he says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. This is God speaking now. God will sprinkle clean water on us, and we will be clean, okay? And, and, and I will cleanse you from all of your filthiness and all of your idols, okay? Listen, people, we got to get this. This is the, this is the, this is the new covenant. This is the gospel. This is the full redeeming work of Christ that he came to do, okay? He's going to clean us up. That's the first thing he do. He's going to bring us to himself. He's going to clean us up. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. He's talking about a heart that is sensitive to the touch of God, that responds to the touch of God in obedience, okay? He says, I will, I will put a, my spirit within you uh, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. In other words, God is saying, I'm going to do such a work that it'll be easy for you to obey me because I'm going to do everything in you so that you can, can walk in obedience to me. You can obey my commands and judgments and statutes because I'm empowering you to do that. I'm going to give you everything you need so that you can live a life of righteousness and thereby vindicate the name of God and glorify upon this earth because the nations will see this transformed person right before their eyes. They'll see the reality of a divine work that only God can do to make us into a brand new creation of righteousness and holiness. And he says, because of that, then you will dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. And that's what Jesus came to do. That's what the gospel is all about. That's how we glorify God. Amen. We glorify him. We vindicate his name by God changing us into this new creation. Amen. Amen. Warren, what do you we have to add to that? Yeah, no, I just I just say amen to all that above and, and uh the reality of that, that's what we're talking about here is 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 that that is available to to us to be able to receive that. You know, like it says in the book of Hebrews that the blood of bulls and goats could never take away our sin, you know, but Jesus came that the blood of Jesus could. It had the power in in, in order to do that, you know, but that can again. 
God says in, in the book, is, I love that, Ezekiel, where he's saying, I'm not doing this for your sake. And really, when you look at it, the reality of that happened in Acts chapter 2. When the Spirit of God came, things changed. Before that, all the disciples were behind closed door for fear of the Jews. Jesus denied, uh, I mean, Peter denied Jesus because he had fear in his heart. But you look at ap after Acts chapter 2, things changed. Things yeah. changed drastically. All of a sudden, Peter stood up amongst them and said, you crucified him. What happened? Where did the boldness come? Where did the fear go? Where did the change come from? All of a sudden, it said the people that had numerous houses or things divided up their things and being able to, to, to share it and give it to other people. So it's this is the good news of the gospel. This is the good news. The, the Pharisees is all they could end up with was what we would call self-righteousness. They would just be able to really look good in church and, and uh, you know, do all the wonderful things. But Jesus called them white and sepulchers. He said, on the outside, you're clean and white, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. So we're talking about the reality that brings such thankfulness to you, such glory. The struggles in my life before, the things that I struggled with, the things that I, that I just couldn't overcome. Like in Romans chapter 7, the things that I want to do, Lord, I just can't do. You know, I want to be able to walk in, in, in love toward everybody. I want to be able to be patient with my wife. I want to be able to do all these wonderful things, but I just don't have the strength. And it's not the strength, it's the ability that God wants to change your heart. But the beauty of it, like, like in Ezekiel, it says, he says, I'm not doing this for you. I mean, God, it's amazing when you look at the magnitude of what God is. And us as human beings, he says, what manner of love hath the Father bestowed upon us? What kind of love of the Father bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God, the children of God? You could have been born a, 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 a bug or a rat or whatever, but we've been born and, and, and given the heart to be able to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to be saved, to have eternity before us, to be able to walk free in, in the glory of God. But the most critical part that we're trying to say that really in our heart in this is it's all about God's glory. It's Amen. all about God's glory. I know that, that for me in the beginning, I really didn't quite see that. I, yeah, I know that. Yeah, we're, we're to glorify God in all that we do and eating, drinking and everything, you know. But it seemed like the reality of that started to come more and more. And I started to read and study. I, re I remember probably 30 years ago, I had a book that I had, uh, I think, Kenneth Hagin uh, Jr., uh, The Untapped Power of Praise. And it was kind of a new thing. Like, oh, that's good. You know, but it kind of opened my eyes at that time 30 years ago. But when you walk in the reality and see the power of it, the power in your life to be able, not just something that you're doing to God, for God, because you see the reality, the magnitude of what he does in, for you and in you, but you experience that. It's like even for, for, for us, we've been doing like a, a Monday night prayer in our, in our house for probably 12 years or so. But when we do that, we have probably 30 to 45 minutes in deep prayer and praise. Why? Because the Bible says God inhabits the praises of your people. By the time we get to, by the time that we get to, to actual prayer, the presence of God is so strong that you don't even, it's like you just, you just want to sit and just bask in his presence. Think about that scripture, taste and see that the Lord is good. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, enter into his courts with praise. There's something about that is so, and when you see the reality of it and what God, I mean, God called us all the wonderful things that he's done in our life. I mean, he, I mean you, you can't even put it into words. It's so far beyond God deserves our glory. So anyway, I'm just seeing the reality that my life, what happens in my life, when, whenever we pray, whenever my wife and I are praying together, you know, and God answered, boy, I tell you what, that's the important time to say, not time just to say, oh, that's good that God answered prayer. No, thank you, Father. You did this by the power of your grace. You did this, God. And I, can get, I can feel the presence of God right now even saying that. Because it's something out of our heart. And he inhabits those praises. I don't know all that, but I, I can experience that. I don't know all the Greek and the words and everything. George would probably have a greater idea about that. But I experience that. I experience that in praise and the presence of God and all these wonderful things. And the beauty is you can't do it in your own strength. 
It's like Paul said, I'm those that have no confidence in our flesh. No confidence. Everything is by the spirit of grace. By God, the, God, the spirit that he would move in our midst, that he would touch us and deliver us and, and answer our prayers. They were under not the old covenant of the law, but the new covenant of the grace of God. That sin would not ever dominion over us. Why? Because it's a whole new covenant orchestrated, come into being by the blood of Jesus, that what the blood of bulls and goats couldn't do. And that's what I'm saying. It's just something that, but yet to enter in, people could agree with that and say, yeah, Warren, George, I, I, I agree with that. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds good. But to make mental assent to that doesn't mean that you're entering into the reality of that. And that's what we want to encourage you to do is when we're talking about sanctification, when we're talking about the love of God shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost, when we're talking about their hearts made pure, when we're talking about all these things, you have to have faith to, to enter into that. God's made it available to you to be able to receive that, but it just doesn't happen. If, if, if righteousness came by the law, then Christ died in vain. You know, it talks about what's that one scripture that, that they frustrated the grace of God because they tried to do it in their own strength. The word frustrate is neutralize. You can neutralize the grace of God by you trying to do it yourself. So anyway, we're just trying to encourage you to enter into the reality of Ezekiel. Amen. The reality where all of a sudden you can say, God, he's done it. He's done it in my heart. I can do things that I can, I can love my enemies now. I can bless those that persecute me. I'm on, the, I'm on, the narrow, I'm on that narrow road <laughs> that leadeth to life now. So it's a great thing. It's a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's not a, we're not talking about the, the Old Testament thing. Be holy, for I am holy. You know, no, no, it's the good news that God says, I want to make you holy, but not for you. I want to do it for my glory, for my name's sake. And when it happens, then you can just say, oh God, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I struggled for years and years and years with everything that I couldn't get out of. But you, by the blood of Jesus, by the grace of God, by this dispensation of grace, that the, uh, the Strong's Concordance talks about the definition of grace. He said it's the divine influence of the spirit of the living God. Well, plus it's his divine favor upon us, you know, undeserving. But it says it's the divine in influence of the spirit of God upon what? The heart of man. Where is sin nature? In the heart of man. Where do you need God's grace? In your heart to be able to cleanse you. So my encouragement on that is just, you know, we've got more, more reasons when you, when you believe that, understand that, pray for that, walk in the reality that your heart's been changed, your heart's been purified. Oh, then it's just praise you, God. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. And, and, and the, 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 the thing we want you to see here, though, is this, was, this is God's purpose of salvation. Yes. And just as we saw in these prophetic scriptures in the Old Testament, we, we can find these, and, and when it talks about salvation, when it talks about why God saved us, why he created us, it's all to this end. Isaiah 43, 6 and 7, he says, I will say to the north, give up, to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from ends of the earth, even everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, who I have made. Why did God create us? He created us for his glory. How does he create us for his glory? By making us the vessels of his glory so we can glorify him upon this earth by our trained, changed life. In Romans chapter 9, verse 23, he says, And what if he thus purposes to make known and show the, show the wealth of his glory in dealing with the vessels of his mercy, which he's pre 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 he has prepared beforehand for glory? Right in the, in the New Testament, in Romans, he says, God prepared us beforehand for his glory. In other words, again, his purpose was to create us and save us to glorify him upon this earth. In uh, Psalms 85, 9, he says, surely his salvation is near to those who reverently and worshipfully fear him and is ready to be appropriated that the manifest presence of God, his glory may tabernacle and abide in our land. Again, his salvation is to the end that we would glorify him. In Ephesians chapter 1, he says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. What's he saying? 
before we ever existed, before God even created this earth, he already had a plan that we would be a holy people unto him. Why? Because in verse 12, he says that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory, that we will glorify him upon this earth. So how do we connect this? How do we get this righteousness, this glory, this salvation all together? Well, Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, he brings it all together in one passage of Scripture. Notice what Paul says. I'm going to read this through the uh, Amplified Bible. He says, But we, brethren, beloved by the Lord, ought and are obligated as those who are in debt to give thanks always to God for you, because God chose you from the beginning as his first fruits, his first converts. Now look what he tells Look what Paul tells us how God saves us. For salvation through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and your belief in, adherence to, and trust in, reliance on the truth, it was to this end he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain and share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. That's it. That's the gospel. God saves us. He, he shed the blood of Christ on that cross for, our, for us to do what? Exactly what we read in Ezekiel 36. To wash you, to take away your idols, to remove your sin, to cut out the stony heart of flesh, to give you a new heart, to give you a new spirit, to give you a new nature, to give you the Holy Spirit. So what? You can live a life of holiness, a life of righteousness of God, thereby vindicating the name and glorifying upon this earth. How does he do it? He sanctifies us by, through the saving work. He sanctifies us by the Holy Spirit of God. He comes in. He washes us. He sanctifies us. He justifies us in the name of Jesus by the Spirit of God. That's what he does to make us do what? So that we, so that we can do what? We can be uh, uh, obtain and share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does he do that? How does he do that? That's what the Holy Spirit does. He inhabits us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. That was the whole mystery of this gospel. That's something they could understand in the Old Testament, that God would literally come to dwell inside of us. The God of glory would dwell in us. So when he talks about that, 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 that if Christ be lifted up, all men would be drawn unto him. What's he talking about? When God's glory, God's presence in us is manifested to those around us, that they will see Christ in us. They will see his righteousness, his love, his compassion, his grace, his mercy. They will see him in us and be drawn to Christ in us, the hope of glory, because we're manifesting that glory and vindicating his name. And, and all it was the ultimate purpose of? The ultimate purpose of it all is to do what? To bring the souls to the kingdom of God. To bring all men to Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's, that's again, what, what, what Warren is saying. That's the good news. That's the good <laughs> news of the gospel. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah it's just, like I said, it's it's something that, that, that God has made available. And and we've got a we've got a massive enemy that's Satan. He doesn't want you to enter into that at all. I know when we share about these things, even the Bible talks about blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness sake. And you think, well, why would why would you be persecuted for righteousness sake? Well, I tell you what, when you start to share about holiness, about sanctification, about righteousness, you know, the Bible says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you can't enter into heaven. That's what it says. You can't do it. Because the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees was all external. It was all external. Like we said, inside they were full of dead men's bones. And in some ways, that's like we are. We could come to church, we could praise, we could say everything, but but still we know that there's those things in our life. There's that anger, there's this lack of patience, there's that all the different things that the, that the Word of God tells us that to be, be uh, concerned about, <laughs> warns us about, if, if you can be delivered for that for the glory of God. You know, I think about two examples of this. One of the great sermons that I would, if you have never heard of it, I don't know if I've ever talked to you, George, about this, uh, uh, Paris Reedhead. He made a sermon years ago. It's online. You can get it, but it's called 10 Shekels in a Shirt. And in that, uh, at the end of that, he gives an example about these two, I think, Moravian young missionary, uh, young men that were, they heard about this South Pacific Island. I might get all the facts wrong because it's been a long time since I've read it. 
but but they heard about this island that was owned by this this man that that had all these slaves there and they they would do things agricultural thing farming whatever it would do and he never allowed any christians on on this island with a lot of people there that had never heard the gospel so these two young men god put it upon their heart to be able to give their body to sell their whatever to be able to get enough money to be able to go over to this island to be able to preach to never return again to give their life to be able to do this and they they made this decision they told their their family their family you know of course couldn't quite understand it this is quite a thing they're never going to come back they're given their life to be able to go to this island to be able to share the gospel to people that would never hear it but one of the things that said that when they got on the boat and it said the ropes were they untied the ropes and the boat was leaving the ship to go to this island and that, that all the family are there sitting around, you know, in tears and just really concerned. And all of a sudden, the last words that this, these young men yelled, or one of them yelled across, across the water, was, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. God almost makes me cry. But yet that was the cry of their heart, that the lamb that was slain would receive the reward of his suffering. And that's what it is for you, church. That's what it is for you when you believe God can do that. All the the all the 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 assaults of the enemy would come against that, you know. And and back in again, like I've shared in other things, joining with with uh, with George, you know, one of the things that you see is accompanying this, accompanying the reality of your heart being purified, is that there's there's also you come under a new ability to receive the power of God. Like I said before, for me, I would study revivals and study healing evangelists and John G. Lake and Smith Wigglesworth, the Haberdies revival, you know, Azusa Street, all these things. And I would be crying out to God, what is it, God? What made this happen? What was the key that turned this? You know, you know, there's prayer. Yeah, that's, of course, you know, humility. You know all those things, but I couldn't figure it out. What it was would cause God to be able to pour a spirit out in such a powerful way that not just the church would feel the presence of God, but that, that the whole country would be shaken, not because the whole churches would gather together in, in unity, but a lot of times by one man, by one woman, by one person. And all of a sudden, like I said before, all of a sudden when I, when I found the answer, you'd think I was excited. You'd think I'd say, boy, that's really great. But I was, I was angry because what they had said, when I started to read or see behind what they shared, is that these men had actually said that God had purified their heart. God had sanctified them. God had given them perfection. In other words, God just took them back, basically back to before Adam and Eve sinned. They were perfect. That's, that's what sanctification is. It's being able to be taken back to that place before sin entered into the room, into the realm. It's to be able to walk in the reality of deliverance from Romans chapter seven. The thing that I wanna do, I can't do. The thing that I don't wanna do, I do. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Well, Romans chapter eight, I said, I thank my God that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. But anyway, back to my thing with the revivalists. I was angry. I thought, well, it's amazing that God used these people in spite of this wrong doctrine, wrong teaching, you know? And the more that I would read and study the different different revivalists, the same thing. They'd speak of sanctification. I just thought it was just an external standard. The ladies would wear long dresses and wear their hair in a bun and different things like that. But all of a sudden I started to realize these guys, these people are talking about that God had actually purified their heart. He'd taken sin away. And slowly, 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 like I said, so if you're battling with what were George and I are shared, I could agree. That was me. I was there big time. But the more that I looked at the word of God, and really, how does God get the glory if you stay in sin? How does God get the glory? How does the blood of Jesus, how does the lamb that was slain, behold, the lamb that was slain, who taketh away the sin of this world. His name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save you from your sin. But back to this thing, why? For his name's sake, for his glory. Amen. You're doing this for his glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me just add to what you were talking about, those young people on that island. Again, why this is so important that God brings us into this work so that we, again, our whole purpose is to glorify God. And that uh, Paul tells us that, that uh, uh, we're not our own. We've been bought with a price and we are to live, to glorify God in body and spirit. Well, I, I, the, the importance of this comes out when you really understand how we glorify God. The number one is we've been looking at 
God is glorified when we live a life of righteousness and holiness. In other words, God is glorified through our changed, transformed life. Because what that does is reveals the supernatural power of God to make us into a new creation in a real and practical way. But the second way that we glorify God is the things because we does change our life. And he gives us this passion, this love for God, this zeal, this fervency. He, gives us, he imparts in us his Holy Spirit and his power so that we can actually do the works of God. We can go forth and preach this gospel. We can go forth and, and, and bring healing and deliverance and, and salvation, okay? So we glorify him in two different ways. The way we live, we reveal Christ's power and glory to change us new creation, but also the things we do glorify God. For example, in John 17, 4, he says, Jesus says himself, I have glorified you on the earth. How did he glorify him? I have finished the work which you've given to me to do. In other words, he was saying, by doing the things that God has called us to do, we glorify God. We bring glory to his name. In John 15, 8, by this my Father is glorified. What does he say? That you bear much fruit. In other words, when we save souls, when we reach souls, the lost for Jesus Christ, we are glorifying our Father in heaven. It brings glory to God for souls to be saved. Amen. And, and that's what it's all about. We, everything we do, every time we heal somebody, what happens? People give praise and honor to God. We're glorifying his name. When we manifest his presence and power, people are delivered. Demons are driven out. People's lives are changed. What happens? People glorify <laughs> the name of God. He gets the glory. Amen. Praise God. Everything we do in the name of Jesus, using his gifts and anointing and power he's given to us, brings glory to God because it's turning the hearts of people back to him. They are acknowledging God as the one that do, does these things because, again, <laughs> We're just temples of clay. Yes. It's not us. It's Christ in us doing the works. Amen. Yeah. That's why, again, we don't touch his glory. We don't take credit yeah. for the things that God <laughs> does. It's God doing it. It's like Paul says. Uh, he says, I, don't, I won't speak of anything that, 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 that Christ has not done through me. In other words, Paul says, it's not me. It's Christ in me doing the works. <laughs> I don't take the glory. I'm just the best I'm just a, a, a clay pot through which God is working and moving. He gets the glory. Amen. We give Amen. all the glory to him. Okay. Yeah. I don't want the glory of God. I, you, you know, I just, <laughs> I'm always joke with people when they try to, you know, give me praise and stuff. He says, wait, wait a minute. Give God the glory. Why? I don't want to be like Herod. You know what happened to Herod when, when they began to praise him and, and he didn't say anything? He got eaten up by worms. Yeah. Because he was taking the glory. He was he's giving himself the glory. So he got eaten up with worms. I don't want to be eaten up by worms. <laughs> Amen. I want God to get the glory. So so yeah. again, we have to keep that humility. We have to keep that right standing with God. But again, we this is why we need this work. This is why uh, uh, God has has sent Jesus Christ to do this in us. So that we can, he can be glorified, his name can be vindicated through both the change of our life and also the works that we do by the power of his Holy Spirit working in us and through us. Amen. Amen. Yeah, one other thing too, George, that really is important, I think right now, with we're looking at what's happening in Israel. We're looking at, at just uh, the chance, uh, the possibility of things really, really getting crazy. Uh, the border's opening up in the United States where a lot of people that could be uh, Hamas or whatever are coming in, and I know a lot of people uh, that 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 are very very fearful yes. about things. A lot of people that are very very fearful. Well, the beauty of of this this, if you want to call it a package of all the wonderful things that happens when God purifies your heart, like it says in First John, there is no fear in agape, but agape love. Cast out all fear. I see the things that are happening. I'm concerned about it, but I've got no fear. That's one of the beautiful things that, that we need right now. I know so many people that they're just in fear night and day. They're just fearful about this, fearful about their kids, fearful about this, fearful about all of us, all these wonderful things. You can't take fear out of yourself. You can't just, quote, renew your mind. I mean, you might be able to do a little bit of that, but that's the beauty. You look at the disciples before the day of Pentecost. Like I said, they were all behind closed doors for what? Fear of the Jews. Something happened on the day of Pentecost. 
on that day where God says, I'm doing this not for your sake, but that I would get the glory, that all of a sudden the fear was gone. It was taken out. That's where Peter could stand up and, and say, you crucified them. What gave them the boldness? What gave the different things? Like I said, yeah, the boldness, but fear was gone. It was eradicated. So like I said, especially at a time like this, where there's so much pressure in the world. I mean, it's prophetically, it's just, we're at, we're at a tipping thing, right? Almost spoke pointing to straight up. But anyway, just my encouragement that that's a part of this package. If you're experiencing tons of fear, that's another sign that you need this. You Amen. need the reality, not just to give God the glory, but that you would be delivered from that fear. Amen. And, and again, speaking about this time that we're in, uh, God uses, is everything for his glory and and a lot of this shaking that's taking place it's been prophesied by by tons of people you go watch my video from about a month ago uh or so about the dream i had but 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 we have to understand that god uses these things for his glory and uh he talks about it in luke chapter 21 that uh when when these things start everything starts going bad on the earth and like my brother was saying what we're saying the fear of God grips people's hearts. That's what we're seeing happening right now. But in, in uh, Luke 21, 13, he says, but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. In other <laughs> words, this is an opportunity for the church to rise up and reach these people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But how do we do that? They've got to see something different. They've got to see somebody that has an answer. They've got to see somebody, like Warren says, that is living a life of love and joy and peace and, 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 and uh, no fear in the midst of all this shame and these things going on. How do we do that? Well, they've got to see God's glory in us. They've got to see God's righteousness in us. And, and let me just give you two scriptures along that line, because this, again, is all about the harvest. Everything is about the harvest. Everything is about reaching the lost for, the, for Jesus Christ. God's not willing any should perish, but all the country repents. God is after souls. He, he, he saves us. He sanctifies. He does all this work to make us fishers of men, to make us witnesses, to make us people that will go out and, and make disciples of every single person. That's the purpose. Why don't we see it happen in the church? Because people aren't sanctified, because they're not on fire, because they're still caught up in their selves, caught up in sin, caught up in the cares of this life, caught up in, in, in money and all this stuff, rather than be the, uh, glorifying God with all their life. Notice what he says in Isaiah chapter 62, 1 and 2, and Isaiah 61 through 3. It's all about the harvest. It's all about that. And when we begin to fulfill these scriptures, that's when we'll see the harvest come in. But notice what he says, for Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. And Isaiah 60, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. And he warns us, he tells us, for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness of people. That's what's happening. That's what's producing this fear. What does he say? But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles will come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. This is how you bring in the harvest when they see God's glory, God's grace, when they see people that have been so totally transformed and changed by the redeeming work of Jesus Christ, by the blood of a lamb, walking and living out this newness of life, they're going to be drawn to him. They're going to be drawn to God's manifest presence within us. They're going to be drawn to Christ seen in us. They see Christ in us, the hope of glory. They see his righteousness manifested through us in our love, in our care, in our concern, in our reaching out to them. That's what's going to bring in the harvest. And again, it's all wrapped up in this nice, pretty little package. This gospel, this, this God thing that he's given to us, wars, sanctified, justified, a new heart, a new spirit, the Holy Spirit. Everything we need has been given to us so that we can bring in the weeks of harvest. And what happens when we bring in the weeks of harvest? We bear much fruit. The Father is glorified. He is glory. Yeah. You know, to, to, to think too, George, you were talking about the things that God utilizes in order to open our, to, to show us. 
uh, you know, issues in our life, things that we need, that we need this, this, uh, this reality of, of, of sanctification. I think about in Deuteronomy, it says, for these 40 years, God says, I led you through the wilderness in order that I might humble you and show you what was in your heart. But what happened to them? What God had designed to, to give them a hunger to be able to, to go into the promised land, all of a sudden they wanted to go back to Egypt. You know, and so many times and they don't see the power of God to be able to, to deliver them. So that's one of the things that, that's a challenge is to be able to show you that maybe these giants in the land, the sin nature in the land, I don't know if that's exactly what it, what it returned, but that's sometimes what happens. People just see the sin nature and the things is, is too big. That's too big for God. He couldn't do that, but you still got to go back and look, you know, how, what, what kind of a price did God pay? Did Jesus pay in order to bring you into that reality? Not the doctrine. That's that's the thing that we that we get. I get concerned about because you can agree with what we, what George and I are saying. You can say, yeah, I agree with that. I, but that doesn't bring you into sanctification. It's a part of it, agreeing with the promises of God, the exceeding great and precious promises of God. But apart from faith, it's impossible impossible to please Him. And that's where you've got to have faith to be able to believe God and hunger those that hunger and thirst after not the righteousness that the scribes and Pharisees because they didn't have it. The blood of Jesus wasn't shed, but those that hunger and thirst after that righteousness will be filled. So that's what I pray to you, is that God would spurt, spurt you, that you could see this reality, that you could, and back then again, not for your sake, but for God's glory. And that we Love might it. have testimonies in, in the comment section down below. Yeah, Brother Warren. Yeah, Brother George, I see that, and I'm praying for that. Please pray for me, because I might, I'm, I'm, I'm seeking it. And we'll pray for you. If you want prayer to enter into that, George and I would love that. So I would just encourage you, encourage you. That is the good news and the amen. good news for his glory. Amen and amen. As we, we kind of wrap things up here, let me just let me just pray the word of God over you right now from first, uh, sec, uh, sec Thessalonians 1, 11 and 12, because uh, th this is, again, how, how do we get into this? Well, it begins with seeking him. The Lord tells us to pursue holiness without which no one should see God. We gotta do our part. We've got to pursue it. We've got to recognize the need. We gotta recognize that we've got sin in us, that we need God to come and wash that sin out to fulfill Ezekiel 36, to fulfill the, the, the uh, redeeming work of Christ in us. But here's what Paul prayed, okay? And I'm gonna pray this for you right now. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and, and the work of faith with power. Why? That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. How does he do it? Well, Paul tells us in Acts chapter 26, Paul tells exactly what he was called to do. And it's right along this same exact line, okay? He said this, he, God sent him for this purpose. God sent me for this purpose. God sent Warren for this purpose. God sent the church for this purpose, okay? To open your eyes, to open your eyes, to give you revelation, to give you the truth that will set you free, to open your eyes, amen? As you hear the word, you must look unto the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of your understanding, to give you the revelation that will produce the faith that will bring forth the, 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 the promise in the, in the promise of God and bring forth the power of God to bring you into this work. So I'm praying right now that God open your eyes yes. in order to turn you from the darkness to the light, from the power of Satan to God, that you may receive remission of sins and an inheritance among who? those who are sanctified by faith in Jesus Christ. How are you sanctified? By faith in Jesus Christ. Again, we're not talking about works. We're not talking about what we do. We're talking about what God does. Again, go back to Ezekiel. I will cleanse you. I will wash you. I will take away your idols. I will take away that stony heart. I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new spirit. I will put my Holy Spirit in you. Okay? God does it. How does he do it? By the power of his Holy Spirit, bringing the blood and to wash you clean, to purify you, to make you into a new creation, to bring you into the full redeeming work of Christ. So we are sanctified by faith in Jesus Christ. The same way on, on Acts chapter 2, how are, they, how are they sanctified? You go to Acts 15, 9, where he talks about what happened uh, in chapter 2. He says their hearts were purified 
by faith in Jesus Christ. Their hearts were purified by faith in Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's what Jesus came to do so that we could become a people that glorifies, that vindicates God's holy name by glorifying upon this earth, both in the way we live, but also the things that we do. Amen. Where you go? One more last word here. Yeah, the, the, the one other thing, too, the, the beauty of this is that, that Paul says, I've done everything possible to maintain a pure conscience between God and man. If you're living in the reality of sin nature and doing things wrong or whatever, that really, it, it, it affects your conscience, you know. So that's another thing that's just a wonderful thing, that your conscience can be pure between God and man. That all of a sudden there's no hindrances between you and God. So just another added bonus. I can go a little bit on that, but that's just enough right now. But it's a beautiful Amen. thing to have a pure conscience, to just feel Amen. that, yeah, I'm Amen. walking in the reality of, of and, this. And, and that talks about the totality of this work that Christ does. You can read all of this in Hebrews, particularly uh, chapter 8, 9, and 10. He talks about there's no, no, no even consciousness of sin anymore because he's so, well, it's like he, he says in, in Hebrews 9, he saves you to the uttermost. <laughs> completely an eternal redemption absolutely perfectly you're free indeed completely totally forever there's no conscious sin why because there's no sin left in you when he when he, he says you're clean you're clean you're whiter than snow amen this is what jesus came to do so praise god so uh let me encourage you listen we we put out a lot of word here today a lot of scripture go back <laughs> listen to the video, write down the scriptures, ask Holy Spirit to give you revelation, to open the eyes of your understanding, be like the Bereans, don't take us for what we're telling you, search it out for yourself, God wants you to know the truth, Holy Spirit <laughs> is there to teach you and lead you and guide you into the truth that will set you free, go back, write them down, meditate on them, ask Holy Spirit to show you the truth, and he'll do it, why? Because he wants you war sanctified and justified. He wants you alive unto God, dead to sin, and living in this zeal, this passion, this fervency for God. He wants you to be holy. Amen. <laughs> it's his will. It's his purpose. It's his calling. So you got to do your part. Amen. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, I just pray, just open the eyes of the understanding of your people, Father, break through the darkness of understanding, break through the lies, the deception, the false doctrines, Father God, and bring forth the truth that will set your people free. Lord, convict people. If they're living in a, in a condition of sin and, and self worth if they're not on fire for you, if they're not a revived and a living for you, Father God, convict them. Lord, draw them by your spirit, Father God. Show them the truth. Open the eyes of understanding and work and move mightily, Father God, to bring them into the full truth truth, Lord, that they can glorify you upon this earth, and they can reach souls for the kingdom of God to bring in the harvest, Father God. So, Lord God, we just thank you for what you do. We thank you it's already done. We thank you it's grace and faith. We thank you, Father God, that you will move upon hearts and minds right now in Jesus' name and bring them in, in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Praise God. Well, thank, thank you again for being with us everybody on Facebook Live. Again, share these videos. People need to hear the truth. People need to hear the gospel. And uh, again, Facebook Live, YouTube, all of these videos. There's tons of them on there. You can go back and get anything you need to, to know. It's all in there. Uh, Warren, thank you for being with me again today. Uh, you just uh, really appreciate your, your input and, and uh, uh, just the, the, the things that you share. So we uh, just really appreciate that. Amen. Amen. So uh, let me encourage everybody again. Uh, you can email us. You got questions? Wait, we're here. We're here to serve. We're here to uh, answer the question. Just email us, message us on on uh, Facebook, however you want to do it, and uh, we'll get back with you. Amen. So uh, just let me encourage you. Keep looking up. Your redemption draws nigh. We are one day closer to the coming of Lord Jesus Christ, and that's you. You can take to the bank. <laughs> it's getting close, people. Yeah. Just look around you. We got to oh, be yeah. ready. And to be ready, you got to be sanctified. So God bless you. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. We'll catch you next time. In Jesus' name, God bless.